So, uh, without further ado, Professor Alban Venisti, the microphone is yours. Thank you, uh, Ronen. Uh, so, it's a great pleasure to introduce to you uh, Natasha Hausdorff. Uh, uh, Natasha is a, is a barrister based in London. She's a, a distinguished uh, alumna of our LLM program. Um, I think uh, you graduated from the first uh, uh, first cohort uh, in class of uh, 2015, 2016. And I was fortunate to have you as my student in my um, laws of armed conflict or international humanitarian law class. And I still remember your interventions and uh, and uh, from which I, I learned a lot already then. Um, Natasha had uh, has, has a law degree from Oxford and uh, later on she was also a fellow at the National Security Law Program at Columbia Law School. Uh, Natasha practiced at Skadden Arps uh, working on complex international disputes and regulatory matters both in London and Brussels. And uh, after graduating from the LLM program at Tel Aviv, uh, she clerked with the Chief Justice of the Israeli Supreme Court, uh, Miriam uh, Noor. Um, nowadays, in addition to practicing as a barrister, Natasha serves as a legal director of the UK Lawyers for Israel Charity Trust, where she um, um, discusses matters of uh, international law and other issues concerning Israel and um, is able to refute all kinds of uh, misinformation about, um, about Israel. She lectures frequently on international law, foreign affairs, national security policy, and among other things, she addressed the UN Human Rights Council in Geneva, uh, the Finnish parliament in Helsinki, the Czech parliament in Prague, and multiple times in the U.S. House of Parliament and House of Lords. And uh, it's, for me, um, watching uh, Natasha giving her talks also over um, video clips that you see or in interviews in BBC and other channels um, gives me great pride um, to uh, to see how um, how wonderfully she uh, she's able to present uh, uh, clear and thoughtful and uh, um, accurate views about uh, and comprehensive views about international law things that I understand some a bit and uh, she's always um, and I remember the, our discussions and always uh, we sometimes had. Uh, arguments, and most of them she won. Uh, so now, uh, Natasha, the floor is yours. I can't tell you how grateful I am for that introduction, uh, Ayal, and um, it's, an, it's a real honor to be here and to be introduced by you. I have extremely fond memories uh, of my year at Tel Aviv University. I have to take issue with the promo video, though. Uh, one of the best cities in the world is is definitely doing Tel Aviv down. Um, so I'm extremely jealous of, of the participants who are, are currently on the program, despite being in Israel in these very difficult times. And I'm also extremely grateful uh, for the opportunity to, to study under Professor Benvenisti and, and others at Tel Aviv University and to focus uh, in my time at Tel Aviv University on some of the more complex issues in the law of armed conflict, um, with the benefit of uh, so many think tanks, um, uh, INSS, of course, is, is around the corner from the campus. Uh, there are many experts uh, that we were able to engage with while I was at the university working on similar issues, many of whom actually I've subsequently uh, shared platforms with at various conferences around the world. So it really is um, a hub for international law, as well as, of course, the technology programs. Uh, but it factors significantly, I think, that Israel uh, has been for some time at the forefront of many of the most critical challenges in applying the laws of armed conflict to extremely complex, um, challenging uh, environments, uh, urban warfare environments, asymmetric uh, warfare environments in which Israel is contending 
with uh, not just one enemy, but multiple enemies uh, who not only fail to comply with the laws of armed conflict at their end, but actually as a modus operandi, use their uh, breaches of international law uh, and their um, violations of the law of armed conflict uh, to their advantage uh, in order to uh, progress uh, their own agendas uh, against Israel. And I think that uh, certainly my experiences in the US, uh, in the academy there, uh, reaffirmed uh, how important the Israeli perspective is on uh, debates in international law and, and the development of international law, especially uh, in armed conflict, uh, because, and I'm, I'm sure that there are many on this program who will be familiar with the origins of the modern law of armed conflict and its development. Um, but as with any uh, legal system, it is a, a living, uh, breathing uh, beast, uh, and it is constantly having to evolve to grapple with uh, new and, and modern challenges. Um, and one of the uh, parallel focuses of my time at, at Columbia University was uh, to focus on uh, cyber and how the laws of armed conflict were going to potentially evolve to take into account uh, the new challenges in that particular arena as well. Um, so with that overview, I suppose, as, as to uh, the, the academic interest of, I've had for uh, some time in the laws of armed conflict uh, and specifically in, in Israel's engagement with them. Um, I, I hope that potentially sets uh, some of the scene, uh, but the second aspect that pertains to this title lawfare against Israel and iron swords, um, speaks to a, a, another part of this equation, uh, because it's not just that Israel is at the forefront of these very uh, tricky challenges in navigating how one upholds uh, the key rules and principles in the law of armed conflict in uh, very much unprecedented circumstances in, in many cases. Um, there is also another factor here, and that is lawfare. Lawfare is an abuse of legal processes and an abuse of law. Um, as in the context in which I use it, I appreciate it's a, it's a term that's had many uh, different definitions. Sometimes they're at variance of each other. But I see it as a, as a negative phenomenon. And it's not negative simply because it leads to uh, aberrations and uh, negative uh, legal outcomes, ones that are contrary uh, in any particular instance to uh, what the proper and appropriate just lawful outcome ought to be. But I think lawfare is particularly pernicious because it puts at risk uh, the legal system itself where it's deployed. It seeks to uh, jeopardize rule of law and the credibility of uh, legal processes uh, where it is deployed. And We've seen uh, one very recent example last week uh, in which I, I anticipate there'll be opportunity for you know, questions and answers. And I hope also that Professor Benvenisti will feel able to uh, speak to his own experiences because um, seeing him participate in Israel's defense in The Hague was uh, a moment of, of great pride for me as a former student. But I know that um, the robustness and thoroughness of Israel's response on Friday last week uh, benefited tremendously from input uh, across the board, uh, the team that uh, participated uh, and prepared uh, Israel's response um, was really second to none. Uh, and it was, uh, again, I say with a great sense of, of pride um, and uh, optimism that I viewed the submissions on Friday that were made. So this is the second aspect of the phenomenon that I think that we're seeing uh, really come to a head now. Lawfare and how it has been used to attack Israel. Uh, why is this specifically in Israel's case? Well, I'm reminded of an op-ed um, that appeared in 2011 by Mahmoud Abbas. Uh, he's still the president of the Palestinian Authority. And writing in the New York Times over a decade ago, 
he called for the internationalization of the conflict as a legal, not just a political matter. And this article um, accompanied uh, the admission of um, the so-called State of Palestine uh, to uh, observer member status at the United Nations. And the article was seeking to uh, use international legal fora, um, including the International um, uh, Criminal Court, the International Court of Justice, the UN Human Rights Council, and other UN bodies, in order to advance an agenda against Israel. Now, lawfare, of course, is very similar to warfare. But reading that piece, it struck me that there was a general realization and an acceptance that Israel's enemies would not be victorious against it militarily. Uh, the idea of uh, defeating the state of Israel, pushing the Jews into the sea, uh, wiping Israel off of the map. Although uh, we still hear frequently refrains, especially uh, from around the Arab world along those lines, I think the vast majority uh, of Israel's detractors recognize ultimately that that is uh, not achievable. And so the switch from warfare to lawfare has been to seek to use international legal fora in particular to uh, promote the delegitimization of Israel and legal attacks upon it. This is not a new phenomenon. It has been the work of decades, and we have seen armies of NGOs, extremely well-funded, uh, promoting this particular agenda in concert, unfortunately, uh, with significant elements uh, of the academy. Now, one aspect of the last few months that seems to have shocked uh, many in uh, the international community has been the level of anti-Semitism across campuses. And I know, especially in the United States, this has had serious repercussions. Uh, but what seems to be still overlooked is the uh, manner in which Israel is discussed in academic circles and uh, in academic publications. And the lawfare contingent of that, uh, unfortunately, goes hand in hand with other aspects of delegitimization of Israel, the narratives of colonialism, uh, of oppression, um, and the uh, increasing formation of, of specific programs and courses of study to focus specifically on uh, that agenda ought to give us pause for concern. Again, this is all by way of a uh, scene setting, but it seems to me uh, that Lord uh, Jonathan Sachs, the former chief rabbi of the United Kingdom, the, the late great Jonathan Sachs, when he talked about the evolution of anti-Semitism, uh, he put his finger on the nub of the problem. Rabbi Sachs explained that in the Middle Ages, when uh, the hatred of the Jews manifested itself as a hatred against their religion, that was a time when religion was the order of the day. And the, the blood libels, the ancient blood libels that Jews would kill Christian children to use their blood to make matzah or in religious rituals, they were extremely widely held beliefs. When science took over from religion, uh, Rabbi Sachs explained that the pseudoscience of eugenics was used by the Nazis to justify a hatred of Jews as a race. And Rabbi Sachs explained that today, science had been overtaken by international law and human rights as the orders of the day. And so the current abuses uh, against uh, Israel, the blood libels, have a new formation. That virus has mutated once again. And we see the terminology that is deployed against Israel, legal terminology, but ultimately political uh, words masquerading as, as legal terms, uh, ethnic cleansing, um, occupation, uh, colonialism, apartheid, war crimes. And when one understands the realities both of Israel uh, as a state and the IDF uh, as a fighting force, it's clear that those uh, blood libels, those canards, 
Uh, and even now, the allegation of genocide, as we heard South Africa advancing at the International Court of Justice, it's clear to anyone who knows the realities of the situation uh, that they are liables, fabrications. But they have first been repeated so frequently. And second, been the subject of so many reports. Of course, the libel of apartheid is featured prominently uh, in reports by Human Rights Watch and Amnesty International. Also, UN bodies that are adopting this terminology and promoting this lawfare. And we see it, of course, uh, also in the context of UN Special Rapporteur reports. And this uh, ecosystem of lawfare has led in many respects to what we saw last week at the International Court of Justice. It is a vicious cycle, but the application to the ICJ plays a very significant part in this process, because up until now, we have seen UN bodies uh, putting out reports that South Africa has relied on extensively throughout its 84-page submission and the submissions that were made uh, before the court last week. Uh, and we have UN Special Rapporteur reports uh, and other NGOs that contribute uh, to the falsification of many of these allegations. But given the stamp of approval by an international legal body, such as the International Court of Justice, those fabrications and that faux evidence will take on uh, an even greater um, mantle and will doubtless be uh, deployed against Israel and individual Israelis, even in domestic courts uh, and individual uh, state jurisdictions. And that is something I think uh, that it's important to be especially mindful of. Again, this is not new. This has been a key part of uh, the agenda and the process of lawfare. And what we've seen uh, at the International Court of Justice uh, is only one part, the recent case is only one part of what has been happening at that court. Um, it may be apparent to most of our audience, but it's important to recognize that there are two types of cases that appear uh, in front of the International Court of Justice. One type is of the contentious nature, so the case that South Africa has brought against Israel. Uh, but the court also sits uh, in an advisory capacity. And in December 2020, uh, the General Assembly of the United Nations uh, posed a question, a series of questions to the International Court of Justice with respect to Israel. Again, our audience may be familiar with a previous advisory opinion uh, produced by the court, uh, that or that the so-called wall opinion from 2004, uh, which assessed Israel's security barrier that was built at a time when Israel was suffering waves of suicide bombings and terror attacks, when uh, discotheques and uh, markets and cafes and restaurants and buses were being blown up. As a result of that wave of terror, the security barrier uh, was built and, and by all accounts, of course, entirely successful in, in defeating that form of terrorism. But when the International Court of Justice uh, was asked to opine on the legality of the barrier, the reasons for it, the security need, the suicide bombing context were all but absent from the court's decision. And in fact, um, another former uh, Supreme Court uh, justice, president of the Supreme Court, um, uh, uh, Aaron Barak, uh, wrote a, a very interesting, I think, analysis uh, of the ICJ um, uh, uh, determination and compared it to the reasoning of the uh, Supreme Court sitting as the High Court of Justice in the Elon Moret case, where the court had acknowledged the security need and the reasons and the justification for the existence of the barrier, but had analysed that and weighed up those security interests against the interests of individual uh, Palestinians who might have been impacted by the choice of route. And going bit by bit along uh, the route of the barrier had made its assessment of what the court considered to be lawful or unlawful, but with the proper context and provided with the proper information, which the ICJ simply did not have. When one compares that 2004 opinion with the one that has been requested of the court more recently, um, just over a year ago, 
uh, UK Lawyers for Israel, which is an organization I've been very privileged to volunteer with for uh, a little over a decade. We put in a submission to the International Court of Justice, along with an international organization called ELNET. And one of the key points that we raised, which I'm given to understand hasn't hasn't featured in any of the other submissions before the court, is to caution the court uh, about the information that it has before it, because it is so partisan, misleading, because these UN reports do not provide the full picture, and caution the court in particular not to follow the course that the International Court of Justice adopted in 2004, uh, and to make a decision based on that uh, misrepresentative information. And we'll see what happens with that advisory opinion. It was unprecedented, the request that was made by the General Assembly uh, to the court, uh, in my opinion, in that rather than seeking a legal ruling on uh, contentious uh, questions of international law, what we saw from the General Assembly was a uh, plethora of allegations against Israel of having violated the Palestinians' right to self-determination, of having uh, committed uh, various other crimes. And rather than actually asking the court to opine on whether or not that was an accurate description uh, or whether or not those allegations were well-founded, uh, the General Assembly simply asked the court, what were the legal repercussions of uh, the fait accompli, uh, that this this uh, shopping list of allegations that the court put, uh, that the General Assembly put towards the court. Um, I haven't seen that in any other case before. It is obviously deeply, deeply unsatisfactory, uh, but it is very clearly in pursuit of this BDS agenda, seeking to uh, obtain an indication from the court that the proper response, the proper ramifications, legal consequences of what it is that is alleged would be sanctions against Israel. And this is, of course, part and parcel of uh, South Africa's uh, agenda uh, and the application of the term apartheid to Israel also. I think the contentious case that we've seen in terms of South Africa's application against Israel is even more egregious. The allegation of genocide is unfathomable and deeply ironic in the context where, of course, this was a term coined by Raphael Lemkin in the aftermath of the Second World War to try and give a lexicon to what had been perpetrated against the Jewish people. This crime, which uh, at its essence is uh, the intention to destroy a group of people because of who they are, to seek to invert that and to use it against the victims of actual acts of genocide, which were perpetrated on the 7th of October, is deeply, profoundly uh, wrong, troubling. And the fact that we have now seen both the United States and the UK uh, come out with strong statements against it, and now Germany also making clear that it will provide submissions on Israel's behalf uh, at the substantive stage of this here of these proceedings, if they should go that far, is significant because we have law-abiding countries that uphold the rule of law that are clearly deeply concerned by the abuse that South Africa is uh, putting the uh, International Court of Justice to. Um, undoubtedly, it is in a position to do that because of some of the recent case law. Uh, the Myanmar case, uh, the Russia-Ukraine case vis-a-vis -vis, uh, provisional measures uh, under the Genocide Convention. Uh, and it is because the court has decided, this, the International Court of Justice still has decided this low bar of plausibility for provisional measures. Uh, and because of this um, uh, library of damning material, uh, fabricated material against Israel produced by that army of NGOs that I mentioned, uh, that the stars have aligned and uh, South Africa feels able to uh, contend at the ICJ in the manner that they have.
There were a couple of uh, interesting uh, nuggets that came out, I think, of the oral hearings that weren't necessarily uh, publicly known before. I mean, apart from calling out uh, the utter nonsense of the allegations and also putting forward robust evidence of all of the measures that Israel takes uh, to protect Palestinian civilian lives and to provide humanitarian assistance, which put the lie to South Africa's allegations. There are also important technical issues that were raised. Uh, so, for example, uh, the communication and correspondence that occurred before South Africa's application between the parties, the question of whether there is a, a properly formed dispute between the parties. And it uh, was clear from the submissions on Friday that Israel has alleged uh, that South Africa has in fact misled the court as to what communications uh, were possible before it brought its application uh, so that its application is ultimately premature and the court would have no jurisdiction to hear it. All of these issues have to, of course, be considered uh, by the court in accordance with Israel's submissions. But uh, I'm hopeful uh, that the International Court of Justice may at least um, no not not be entirely uh, susceptible uh, to this lawfare campaign and, and may still maintain uh, some credibility as an international court. If we compare it, um, and perhaps I can end with, with some of these, these remarks and we'll open up to questions, but if we compare it, unfortunately, with where the International Criminal Court has got to, um, there we see lawfare initiatives against Israel, which have uh, reached a, another level of intensity and which are undoubtedly going to play a significant role in the context of our title, which is uh, lawfare against Israel in iron swords. Um, the International Criminal Court, again, UK Lawyers for Israel, made a submission uh, on the question of jurisdiction, which came before pretrial chamber one in this case, under a previous prosecutor at the ICC, Fatou Ben Souda, who contended that despite Israel not being a party uh, to the Rome Statute, uh, there was in fact jurisdiction to investigate uh, potentially Israelis for uh, alleged uh, war crimes come on to some of the specifics of that in a moment, uh, on the basis that uh, the state of Palestine, so-called, purported uh, to join the court. Now, there are a long shopping list of difficulties with uh, the jurisdictional claims uh, that were advanced by the prosecutor in that case and the uh, legal acrobatics, if I may be permitted to say so, uh, that she engaged in in terms of submissions she made to pretrial chamber one. There was a very courageous uh, dissent from Judge Kovacs in that case, but but ultimately, it's extremely concerning that pretrial chamber one provisionally ruled in uh, the prosecutor's favour on jurisdiction, despite Israel not being a party uh, to the Rome Statute. And there are good reasons that Israel never joined the Rome Statute, uh, similar, no doubt, to the reasons that the United States didn't join the Rome Statute, because despite both of those uh, countries being very involved in uh, initiatives to form the International Criminal Court in the first place, and contributed significantly to some of the drafting of that court's governing uh, statute. Um, it became clear, in, uh, for example, with respect to some of the crimes uh, in Article 8 and the redrafting uh, of, in particular, the uh, crime of, of transfer, forced transfer of people, uh, with the insertion, for example, of the words directly or indirectly, it became clear, I think, at that juncture that there were those that wished to use this court for political purposes rather than legal ones. Uh, and we've seen that despite uh, the United States and Israel uh, not joining, and despite the limitations, therefore, on, on the court's jurisdiction, uh, it is seeking to circumvent those. And I was in Israel in December when uh, the prosecutor, the new prosecutor, Kareem Khan, visited uh, and met with families of hostages. And I was extremely concerned that despite the lack of jurisdiction and Israel's uh, consistent position that the ICC has no jurisdiction, uh, Kareem Khan was nonetheless uh, seeking to advance the court's agenda vis-a-vis uh, -vis Israel. That can only spell uh, trouble, unfortunately, especially in light of so much of the material that is being put in front of the International Criminal Court, 
again, of the same nature, the uh, fabricated allegations and faux evidence that unfortunately is churning through the system uh, and is seeking that judicial stamp of approval uh, in that case from the ICC in order to be uh, deployed against Israeli individuals in the case of the ICC. It's a court that has jurisdiction over individuals and uh, crimes committed by them as opposed to uh, the ICJ, uh, which of course has jurisdiction over states. So that is a little bit of a, an overview of some of the key challenges. Um, when we compare it to the reality of uh, Israel's initiatives, especially in the law of armed conflict, this is where I think that the real frustration uh, lies because uh, the facts of the measures that Israel takes, the lengths that it goes to, to protect the civilian uh, population in Gaza, and its track record in doing so across previous conflicts is uh, all but lost from international discourse and the media coverage of this situation. There is a um, an initiative, a, a group called the High Level Military Group, which I uh, commend to our audience, who have conducted a, a series of analyses of previous uh, conflicts in Gaza and produced a series of reports. Um, Colonel Richard Kemp, uh, who is a British uh, army, uh, former army officer, the former um, commander of British forces in Afghanistan, uh, a member of, of COBRA uh, here. Um, he has uh, taken a leading role in that initiative and also been very clear on uh, the lengths that Israel goes to, to uphold international law. He has said Israel is the most moral army in the history of warfare. And the reason he has said that is because in addition to the basic uh, requirements of the law of armed conflict, the principle of necessity, the principle of proportionality, the principle of distinction, and the importance of taking precautions, Israel in fact goes well above what is required by international law. The warnings that it issues to civilians, of course, also warning of Hamas, warning Hamas uh, and other Palestinian terrorist organizations of incoming uh, attacks. Um, the leaflets that it drops, the telephone messages, uh, telephone calls, text messages, uh, and the uh, facilitation of humanitarian corridors, where the IDF has been protecting fleeing civilians from Hamas who are firing on them. Uh, we we don't even get to the point where we talk about Hamas as violations uh, and its use of human shields. But if we just focus on Israel's actions and Israel's conduct and the proportionality analysis that is conducted by the military advocate general corps who sit outside of the chain of command in the IDF under the authority of the attorney general so that they can make strike by strike calls uh, on a proportionality assessment. Um, all of this is, of course, ultimately lost in the international discourse and those canards and those blood libels abound. And I think we as lawyers have a responsibility. If we are not uh, subject to this uh, onslaught of misinformation and we know the truth of the matter, then I think we also have a responsibility uh, to push back against the misrepresentations, to call out the falsehoods and push back against the abuse of international law. Uh, not just a responsibility of those who have either lived in Israel, studied in Israel, uh, or had their eyes open to the realities there, but also anyone uh, who is a legal professional. Um, in our practice, and I've qualified both as a solicitor and a barrister, there is an expectation that one upholds the law uh, the values of the rule of law. Uh, and as an officer of the court, uh, I would argue that uh, that responsibility applies not just when you are in front of a judge, but also uh, in the broader context of the application of the law to these sorts of issues. It's a responsibility I've always taken uh, very seriously, and it's what I suppose, ultimately drives me uh, to engage in, in these issues. And I'm extremely uh, excited to be able to take your questions. Uh, and I would uh, be absolutely delighted and honoured uh, if there are additional uh, people in the audience who would like to get involved with initiatives at UK Lawyers for Israel, simply lend their voice to pushing back against uh, the lawfare and the misrepresentations. Thank you very much for having me. It's uh, a real honour, as I say. 
Awesome. Thank you so much. Before we open up the floor for questions, uh, Eyal, would you like to comment or say something or ask a question or whatever? I'll give you the first uh, right of refusal. Thank you. Um, listening uh, with great uh, attention to Natasha's um, um, uh, Presenting, I was I was struck by the link that you mentioned by uh, Jonathan, Jonathan Sachs made between the blood libel and the uh, international. I suddenly felt that after after October seventh, I mean it's it's my personal feeling that after uh, October seventh, um, I expected the more international law colleagues to speak um, against um, the, the Hamas attacks, and I was disappointed that they were not. Um, and the other thing I would like to mention uh, in the submission by the by South Africa. Both in the written uh, in the written statement that the, and in the in the presentation before the court on on Thursday, they did not refer only to the uh, alleged genocide, but they referred to the state of Israel as an illegal entity that is exercising apartheid since its uh, creation in. 1948. That's my intervention. Thank you. And and I think that's extremely telling, along with the long uh, list of reports that were cited uh, that go back probably at least a decade, if if not more, uh, and that make many more accusations than just just that canard of genocide. Of course, genocide was was uh, specifically chosen in order to provide the hook uh, at the International Court of Justice because Israel and South Africa are, are parties to the convention. Uh, but more than um, just the you know the case and and the outcome that South Africa is is seeking to achieve vis-a-vis -vis its application for provisional measures, what I think we saw on Thursday was just a PR exercise. Yeah. It it was a you know a, 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 it was a display to the world and it in that respect it has been successful. What yeah. was being discussed that week uh, was Israel's genocide, um, yeah. despite it having no basis in reality, and and that is unfortunately a, a key component of lawfare and of the abuse of international uh, legal fora. Uh, it's to provide that propaganda base for uh, international media coverage. I agree with you. I think it was a great spectacle. It was a PR show. And uh, even though Israel, in my unbiased opinion, was much better still, I think the harm is uh, is huge. I have tons of questions for you, but I want to give the uh, guests here the chance. So if you want to ask a question, please raise your hand, virtual hand. I see there's a, a question from Lindsay Kess. Go ahead, sir, or ma'am. Hello. Yeah, it's it's actually me picking back here on the uh, on on Lindsay's uh, Zoom. Um, I, I'm my name's Martin Pellain. Um, Natasha, I've got a question in respect of advisory opinions, um, and and obviously on the issue of, of lawfare. It, it seems that in recent years uh, we have seen questions being formulated that are deliberately formulated on contentious matters. So I'm thinking about obviously the war case, but also Kosovo and the Chagos case. I'd be interested in your view as to whether that's a concerning development. Is it a way of getting contentious cases by the back door in front of the ICJ? And of course, is it really an attempt to give uh, the ICJ jurisdiction in a case where in reality, um, the interested state itself wouldn't consent to adjudication? And I suppose the so your view on that, I, I'd be grateful to hear. And I suppose the follow up question is really what could be done about it? Um, I'm conscious that in theory, um, the court could decline to give an opinion. Uh, and I know that's perhaps more theoretical than real. But I, I'm conscious that, for instance, I think in one of the dissenting opinions in the Chagos case, um, that was certainly um, an outcome that was being ventilated. 
Yes. So I'd be interested in on your view on those, really those two points. Thank you. Uh, let, let me add a follow-up question to uh, to the previous one because I think uh, it's related. When you uh, discuss what's going to happen, I wonder if you have a view about the uh, possible intermediary injunction that uh, may or may not be given. Uh, what are the chances and which ones exactly in your view? I know it's uh, it's guessing and we don't like to guess, but still do your best. Um, so I think it's absolutely right that there has been overreach Um by the International Court of Justice, which is contributing to the the lawfare initiatives. Um, And one key indicator of that, and it is not a positive indicator, uh, is that um, I believe on the 23rd of May last year, 2023, uh, Iran rejoined the compulsory jurisdiction of the court. What does that tell us? Uh, Except that, um, you know, the, the, the foremost state sponsor of terror um, may be seeking uh, to use the court in the not too distant future to its own advantage. Um, th- that is chilling, uh, and no doubt also a contributing factor in in the uh, the robust position that we have seen the UK, um, Germany, and uh, and the US adopt vis a vis South Africa's application. Um, I think the answer to your first question is is yes. Um, that overreach uh, that I mentioned exists in the context of of purporting to give advisory opinions on cases where it is inappropriate. Um, And there is a clear distinction between the contentious uh, cases and and advisory opinions for that reason. Um, It also exists in the lowering of the bar vis-a-vis provisional measures, um, the uh, threshold of, of plausibility, uh, I, I think is also dangerous uh, overreach by the court and is is encouraging applications of this nature. Um, vis-a-vis Chagos, of course, I think Israel actually intervened, made submissions in in uh, in support of the United Kingdom uh, in that case, and so we'll see if if the UK uh, returns the favour here. Uh, but it is important that one sees law-abiding states, such as the UK, Israel, Germany, the US, uh, having similar concerns about the direction of travel of the court, uh, of it intervening uh, in cases um, through this sort of backdoor, as you say, um, uh, pseudo-hearing contentious cases in the context of an advisory opinion. Um, I mean, it it couldn't have been more controversial, the sorts of issues uh, that the court opined on in the uh, wall opinion, or indeed those uh, that are before it in the context of the General Assembly's um, resolution December uh, 2022. Uh, and the saving grace perhaps is that international court of justice advisory opinions are not legally binding but they are authoritative and they are uh, as the wall opinion uh, was uh, deployed um, especially by israel's detractors uh, so that is of significant concern um i'm not a betting person uh so my you know giving odds on uh, what the court is going to do is is something that i'm i'm going to refrain from engaging with but perhaps i can say this if all is lost at the international court of justice and despite this uh meritless application and despite the very clear robust response that israel gave and despite you know the the clear issues before the court and and the problems with it engaging if the court uh, does not acquiesce to Israel's request to dismiss the application and remove the case from the list. And if it orders provisional measures, the first one being sought by South Africa is that Israel uh, immediately cease its operation in Gaza. What does that mean? Is the International Court of Justice really going to rule that Israel is deprived of its inherent right to self-defense? This is not a right that is bestowed by international law. It is a right that is so fundamental it is inherent. It is recognised as inherent by Article 51 of the UN Charter. No one can uh, bestow or or, or take away that right and that duty. 
every state's uh, duty and responsibility, the highest responsibility of keeping its citizens safe. Not only that, but if we consider that uh, under the Genocide Convention and the requirement to prevent and punish genocide, Israel is also under an obligation under that very convention to uh, eradicate Hamas, to make sure that the 7th of October can never happen again, against the clear, repeated um, uh, declarations by the Hamas leadership that they will intend to repeat the 7th of October over and over again. I mean, what world are we living in if the International Court of Justice uh, can make a preliminary um, indication of that sort? So I think that if it does, I mean, Israel's not going to sit on its hands. It simply cannot. There are rockets, as I know our friends and colleagues in Tel Aviv uh, can attest to, that are uh, continuing to be fired. And um, Hamas uh, continues. I appreciate that Israel has been uh, extremely successful in the north of uh, the Gaza Strip, uh, but out of a, an estimated 40,000 Hamas combatants, terrorists, um, the IDF believes it has uh, eliminated 9,000. We're not quite there yet in terms of defense and removing the threat that Hamas pose. So I cannot see Israel sitting on its hands. So we're left with a situation where uh, the International Court of Justice ultimately loses all credibility. Now, there are academic studies on um, the frequency with which provisional measures uh, are being uh, upheld. And I believe the latest sort of stats on that are around 50 percent, which isn't that impressive. It has been decreasing over time. And certainly in controversial cases, uh, the level of uh, adherence and implementation is, is significantly lower. Um, so uh, we shall have to wait and see. Uh, the court has said as soon as possible could be weeks, it could be months. Um, but the implications of what it will do, especially vis-a-vis -vis the provisional measures application, are significant, not just for Israel, but critically for the credibility of the court and what the International Court of Justice will look like in the future. You know, what, what its standing in the international legal order will be. Sorry, I was muted. Thank you very much. Are there any other questions or should I just go, go on with, with my own questions? Anyone would like to uh, ask anything? Feel free, don't be shy. Okay, so um, you mentioned before that Iran just joined the convention. And my question to you is why South Africa, of all countries that could have um, filed a suit against Israel at Hague, why, why South Africa? So I was in South Africa over the summer uh, on a on a speaking tour on international law, and I engaged with a variety of institutions there. I had one particular experience, which was uh, which was on an afternoon off. I was staying in Cape Town next door to the Museum of Contemporary African Art, and I visited. And the first exhibition that I walked into was a homage to Yasser Arafat and the PLO and Palestinian terrorism. And the thesis was artists against apartheid, artists against uh, Zionism. But uh, the, the, the manner in which uh, such a violent agenda had infiltrated uh, even an art gallery was extremely instructive. Um, unfortunately, uh, the close link between uh, the ANC uh, in South Africa and, and Palestinian terrorism uh, is well established. And of course, it's not just that. Uh, there was a, a close relationship also with Muammar Gaddafi. There is a deepening relationship with Iran. Um, and the South African government, and I don't say this of the South African people, uh, because I, I traveled through um, Johannesburg, Cape Town, uh, and Durban. And uh, so many uh, of the people that I engaged with are, are staunchly opposed to this. But from a government level, there is the, um, 
the, the close connection uh, that it has had for a long time with anti-Israel forces. Uh, but there is also the dire situation that the South African government currently finds itself in. Um, another takeaway from my travels there was load shedding. Because of the levels of corruption, uh, the uh, government can no longer afford to keep the electricity running consistently across the country. And so there are uh, predetermined electricity outages uh, across uh, the country, including the major cities, where the electricity just goes off. Um, so that you know those that can afford it make sure that they are uh, essentially supplied off of the national grid. The uh, dire domestic situation in South Africa is such that an exercise like this uh, distracts from the failings domestically. Uh, and there are many South African uh, politicians and, and, and writers and commentators that have been um, uh, addressing this phenomenon, this issue in the last couple of weeks on, on precisely those lines and are extremely critical of the approach that the government has taken. So in those respects, it's it's um, not surprising. It's also not surprising, uh, you know, the, the Durban um, conference, the Zionism is racism uh, resolution, one of the uh, more shameful uh, elements of, of the history of the United Nations. Uh, it's, it's not by coincidence, I think, that it took place in Durban. Um, so there has been a, a significant agenda there for uh, a substantial period of time. And um, the, the fact that it seems, uh, if one uh, follows the Israeli submissions on the Friday, that uh, South Africa didn't go through uh, the usual process of engagement with Israel before bringing its application, the nature of the application, the fact that it wasn't just focused on uh, the issue of genocide, but uh, alleged uh, a history of, of apartheid against Israel uh, lasting 75 years. Uh, over 75 years. So this is an objection to the state of Israel's very existence. Uh, you know, we can argue about post-67 and what the situation uh, is, although I would uh, encourage people to argue about that because, again, the received wisdom uh, on uh, Israel's position after 1967 is, is, is deeply, deeply problematic as far as I'm concerned. I'll come on to that with your permission just for a few minutes um, in a moment, if I may. Um, but the position that South Africa has taken on this for su a substantial amount of time has been um, hugely problematic, um, horrific in many respects. And so its application uh, does seem to have been long in gestation premature uh, and um, and as I say, general as opposed to uh, just uh, focusing on, on this uh, canard of, of genocide. Um, the reason I, I think that there are long-standing problems here with uh, discussion over Israel and even the status of the territory. So we spent most of this session talking about international humanitarian law and the law of armed conflict, but there are other aspects of public international law which are deeply, deeply misrepresented vis-a-vis uh, -vis Israel. Um, and one example is uh, the application of a universal rule of customary international law that determines the borders of a state when it comes into existence, a rule called uti possidetis juris. It was established, um, well, first started to emerge in the uh, 19th century uh, with the withdrawal of the Spanish uh, from South America. It was applied uh, in Asia, in Africa, at the dissolution of the former communist federations. It's applied to generally states emerging from mandates, um, Mesopotam the mandate for Mesopotamia when it became the Kingdom of Iraq. In all of these cases, the rule that determines the borders of newly emerging states says that the new entity at its declaration of independence takes on the pre-existing administrative lines that preceded it. Well, in Israel's case, after the severance of Transjordan uh, by the British, uh, the British mandate, the eastern boundary, ran down the Jordan River to the Red Sea. And when Israel declared independence, it was the only state to establish itself, the only state to emerge out of the British mandate. Absent any agreement to the contrary, the default rule in international law is uti possidetis juris. So the legal position, it seems to me, is that when Israel came into existence, when Ben-Gurion declared independence in 1948, 
Israel's eastern border was inherited from the British mandate. Those administrative lines became Israel's international border. And the, the principle, the rule of Otipos de Juris was analysed by the court in the, it was 1986, the Burkina Faso Mali case, where it talked about uh, why it is that this rule had come into existence. Customary international law, of course, evolves, develops over time. But that rule had come into formation to provide stability, certainty, clean lines, and to prevent fracturicidal struggles as a result of uncertainty uh, when states uh, were declaring themselves. Now, of course, immediately after Israel's declaration of independence, it was attacked by its Arab neighbors, and Jordan occupied, critically along the east, um, eastern Jerusalem and the West Bank, as it then became known, from Israel. But in 1967, when Israel recovered that territory, which Jordan had ethnically cleansed of its Jews, recovered that territory from Jordan, what was its status? The label of occupier has been applied. But if we compare it with a modern example that the world seems to agree on, another application of uti posidetis juris was vis-a-vis -vis the formation of Ukraine. When Ukraine came into existence, it was Uti Posidetis Juris that told the world that Crimea was part of sovereign Ukraine. And that is why the world has been generally of, of a single voice in accusing Russia of having occupied uh, Crimea from Ukraine. But if Ukraine were to recover Crimea in the current war, in the same way that Israel recovered the West Bank and East Jerusalem from Jordan, would anyone accuse Ukraine of occupying Crimea from Russia? No. Now, there are other factors, of course, at play. Many people cite the partition, parti uh, the partition resolution, um, which uh, before Israel's de declaration of independence sought uh, to uh, partition the mandate. But of course, not only was that rejected uh, by the Arabs, it was never implemented. It was also a general assembly resolution, a political resolution. The only UN resolutions that have legal uh, clout are particular Security Council resolutions made under Chapter 7. Um, and so, you know, the, arguing about you know, partition does, doesn't really take us further. Now, that's not to say, you know, that that uh, Israel... Uh, underlying sovereignty, uh, that the uti posidetis juris uh, boundaries, which were, uh, interestingly enough, referred to, referred back to in both the ceasefire agreements that Israel had with Jordan and with Egypt, and also in the subsequent peace agreements with Jordan and with Egypt, references always back to the mandatory boundary. Um, but that's not to say that that dictates any way forward or any uh, future uh, solution or settlement. It does say if we are going to apply international law properly, we are going to apply it equally, then we need to be clear about what the status of the territory, the underlying status of the territory is. Uh, we cannot have a general rule and an exception for a country that people just don't seem to like very much or they have some ideological or uh, political opposition to. That's not how any respectable legal system can operate. Yeah. And, uh, Sorry, go ahead. No, no, I've, and, and and if we're we're going to you know uphold the system, um, yeah. and and the rule of law, then uh, that's you know there are there are many many examples of not just double standards, but you know the rule of law being inverted and, and misapplied vis-a-vis -vis Israel that I think need to be called out. Yeah, um, I want to thank you very much for the main reason we invited you here, which is to talk about uh, the legal fair, the law, I'm sorry, the law fair against Israel in in Iron Swords. Uh, thank you for a fascinating uh, talk uh, with tons of insights. And I want to thank also Eyal ben Venisi for uh, joining us and everybody else for joining us. And Natasha, please, next time you're in Israel, let us know in advance and come and visit us in our office. I'm sure Marie and Renata and myself and Eyal and many others uh, would love to say hi to you. So uh, please let us know in advance. And I hope you come uh, for good reasons and not to watch all sorts of... Uh, suspicious international law delegations coming to Israel to investigate us. So thank you again. Thank you. Um, it's my pleasure to see you all. And uh, I appreciate very much the kind words. And